from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. So that being said, I'd like to welcome you. My name is Allison Starling. I work at ABC7 and anchor Good Morning Washington nice and early on the ABC affiliate here in D.C. Thank you very much. So happy to be back out here for the National Book Vest Festival once again this year. And it's only fitting in this uh, historic location near the Washington Monument, near the Capitol, that we're celebrating here the inspirational and motivational stories of immigrants who have come to our country and sacrificed so much to be Americans. But first, you should know that for our presentation today, we have sort of a special setup. You are a special guest today, and that's because of instead of the typical forum, when the uh, author comes up and gives their presentation and simply takes questions from the audience, instead today, our author somehow convinced a world-famous journalist to come with him and actually do the interviews for him. We don't know how he managed to do that. We'll have to find out. I am happy to introduce two people here for you today, the author and the interviewer, and they happen to be a couple. First, we have Steve Roberts, who has been a journalist for more than 40 years. He was a journalist with the New York Times and with US News. He is, of course, a well-known commentator, a lecturer, a professor, and an author. This is his second time at the National Book Festival. He was here as well in 2005 for his memoir, his childhood memoir, called My Father's House. Secondly, you will be seeing the interviewer, and that is his wife, Cokie Roberts. As you know, Koki is an Emmy, yes, applause for Koki. She is an Emmy award-winning journalist and commentator as well. She uh, is with National Public Radio and ABC News. She and her husband write a popular nationally syndicated newspaper column together as well. They have two children. They have six grandchildren, at least one of which I know is here today, Reagan. <laughs> and uh, they also, in 2000, Stephen Koki published From This Day Forward, which was an account of their marriage and other marriages in American history. And you know what? It spent seven weeks at the Times bestseller list. It's a book that I personally enjoyed very much. And in it, this is one of my favorite quotes. They say, marriage has enlarged our lives, not encircled them. It has opened new doors, not closed them. We are better people together than we are separately. Today, they are here to talk about Steve's new book about the immigration experience and the search for the American dream. That book is called From Every End of This Earth. I hope you will help me to welcome Steve and Koki Roberts. Thank you so much. It was so sweet of you to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, I think someone is supposed to come whisk this lectern away. Um, Otherwise, <laughs> here we go. Um, we'd stand at it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, what a great, what a great day. I mean, uh, uh, Dr. Jim Billington is with us right here, the Librarian of Congress. <laughs> and uh, and Jim and Laura Bush together saw the vision of of a day like this 10 years ago, uh, of bringing hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people on a hot day to the National Mall to talk about books, buy books, and uh, listen to authors talk about books. And what a, what a great thing it is. So my job here today is basically to say to Steve, so tell me the one about. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but first, I know that you like to talk about why you wrote this book in the first place. That's true, um, and uh, thank you. Uh, what did you say your name was? <laughs> uh, we just had our 44th anniversary. I'm still getting used to it. Uh, Although, you know, the best line about Steve's best line, really, about marriage is not in the book, but it is that you can tell a good marriage by the number of teeth marks on your tongue. <laughs> From biting it. Uh, <laughs> Candor is vastly overrated. Uh, but uh, I grew up in a family of, of immigrants. My grandparents are immigrants from Russia and Poland. I grew up in a town in New Jersey, uh, Bayonne, New Jersey, where 
Uh, <laughs> everybody I knew had a grandmother with an accent. Um, I did too, they just had southern accents. That's right. <laughs> and um, I grew up, uh, Bayonne was about 80% Catholic and about 19% Jewish, which is what we were. I thought Protestants were a tiny minority group. I, <laughs> some weird sect. Imagine my surprise when I went to Harvard. <laughs> All these names on the building, Elliot, Weld, Winthrop, so short, <laughs> so crisp. And they ended in consonants. I, um, but uh, it left me with a lifelong interest in immigration. As Allison said, I did a book about my own grandparents' immigration to America. Um, and uh, I then started teaching. All through my writing career, I've written about immigrants. But I started teaching at George Washington University. And I started getting these stories in a writing class uh, of my students from Ukraine and from Vietnam and from El Salvador who were living today the story my grandparents had lived 100 years ago. And that was really the inspiration for the book. Um, almost all of my writing over the years has ruthlessly exploited my family. Uh, and having used up all of that material, I turned to my students. And, um, and in payment for exploiting them, I actually dedicated the book to my students at GW, <laughs> some of whom are here today. But, uh, uh, that was really the inspiration for it. And, um, and you found that there really are, uh, there's some things that are very similar to your grandparents' immigration in the early 20th century, and some things that are very different. Well, uh, uh, my friend Jamie Morris, who just preceded me, uh, made the point that um, uh, historically, immigration uh, was a very lonely process. Um, when my grandfather left Bialystok, which is now in eastern Poland, he was out of touch with his own sister for 50 years. 50 years. There was no Skype. There was no cell phone. There was no internet. 50 years uh, she was behind the Iron Curtain. And the truth is today, there are still things about immigration that never change. Every immigrant in the history of the world leaves something behind. They leave their graves of their ancestors. The air never smells the same anywhere else. The food never tastes quite the same. So this pain of separation is common to every immigrant story in the history of the world. In the 13th century, a Persian mystic named Rumi wrote something called the Song of the Reed. And he said, when a reed is plucked from a reed bed and you blow through it, it makes a very plaintive sound, which is the sound of the pain of separation that the reed feels from having been separated from the reed bed. An immigrant from Afghanistan said to me, that's how I feel having left Af Afghanistan. I'm the reed who's been plucked from the bed, playing that plaintive sound. But uh, in other ways, the this, this situation is very different. I have a student who, uh, whose uh, brother married a, a woman from Brazil. She was from Brazil. and. Um, the woman's family couldn't come to America for the wedding. So my student in her bridesmaid's dress and a digital camera and a laptop went to the wedding, took all these photographs, put them up on the web, and the bride's family back in a tiny village in Brazil watched the, watched the wedding in real time on the surrounding a laptop in their village. My grandfather didn't get to do that. <laughs> so some things never change, but other things are very different. And. Um, but, but you do still have people leaving your grandparents left, essentially, because they were persecuted as Jews in Eastern Europe. And you found a family for whom a very similar story. They weren't necessarily persecuted, but they certainly couldn't fulfill their life's ambitions in Ukraine as Jews. This is actually a family whose son was a student of mine. Uh, and um, uh, Nick and Sarah Stern grew up as young Jews in the Ukraine at a period when uh, anti-Semitism had actually gotten worse, not better. Because Nick's mother was a doctor. He couldn't aspire to be a doctor, because all Jews, uh, by Edict of Stalin, had been prevented from going to uh, medical school. So he became an engineer. It was about the only profession open to young Jews. And so did Sarah. She became an engineer as well. And they met in their first job. And you know, immigration starts with an act of imagination. It starts with a sense of 
there is another life out there for me somewhere else. And I said to the Stearns, where did that spark of imagination come from? So Sarah said, well, we had a family friend who had moved to Israel. And she wrote a letter that my mother read to me. And the letter said, you know, here in Israel, we eat oranges the way you eat potatoes. And that orange became a symbol of another life. And then she said, I used to watch Italian movies. The Russians would never let in American movies. But they would let in movies made by Italian communists, like Fellini and Carlo Ponti. So she said, I would watch these movies, and I never listened to the plot. I looked at the apartments. <laughs> now, my grandfather, the right. sainted Avram Rogovsky, when he came to America and went back in the mid-60s, he decided, when he saw Russia, that the great chink in the Soviet armor, what would pull down the entire Soviet empire, was plumbing. He was right. And that, and that if Russians could see American bathrooms, they would arise as one and revolt against the Russians. <laughs> Now, of course, he was basically right, of course. He was a nutball, but he was right. <laughs> but the Stern story was similar. It was the apartments. It was the, the, the way of life that they saw in these movies. And then finally, they, they decided to emigrate, and it was very difficult. But tell what Sarah's apartment was like. Well, Sarah's apartment, she lived in an apartment where 28 people shared one bathroom. 28 people. And they were well off. Her parents were professional people. So there were certain other impulses to immigrate, and they finally uh, got up their courage to immigrate. But at the time, there was a system. The Soviets were just starting to allow people to immigrate. But they, um, you had to get invited by some relative from abroad. The fiction was it was family reunification. So you had to have a letter from Cousin Morris in Brooklyn saying, I want the Stearns to join me. There actually didn't have to be a Cousin Morris. But you had to get the information to Hayas, the Hebrew Immigration Aid Society in Vienna, who could file a phony application for you. And you had to get the information out. But the Soviets censored this information. They wouldn't let it out. So Nick was a pretty smart guy. He wrote down on little tiny pieces of paper all of the vital information they needed for the application. And he had Sarah sew the little pieces of paper into the elastic of his boxer shorts. And they would give the boxers, every time a Jewish family left Ukraine, they would give them a pair of Nick's boxer shorts and say, here, bring the boxers to Hayas in Vienna, tell them to look in the elastic for our information. It took them 20 tries. As Nick says, you know, there are a lot of guys in Vienna walking around in my underwear. <laughs> and so they finally get out, they breach the border, they're headed for Vienna, they stop for uh, a Coke, and uh, Nick runs off the, 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 the train. He buys the first bottles of warm Coca-Cola he's ever had, and he gives them to his kids. And I said, Nick, what did it taste like? He said, Steve, it tasted like freedom. It tasted like freedom. They get to America. It's the worst day of his life. Some of you have ever been to Russia. You know the plumbing is such keeps coming back to the plumbing. The plumbing is such that the water never rises in the toilet bowl. You flush the bowl and all the water goes out. He's at a Ramada Inn in Kennedy Airport, his first night in America. He flushes the toilet, the water comes back up. He says, oh my God, I've broken the toilet. <laughs> They're gonna send me back to Ukraine. He spends the entire night madly flushing the toilet. He never gets the water down. They finally get to St. Louis and he becomes a very successful engineer. Just to give you a sense of where this family is today, I interviewed them in their penthouse apartment on Central Park West, <laughs> which is only one of their houses because they also have a condo in Florida where, as Nick says, Sarah's closet is bigger than the apartment she grew up in. So the American dream still lives. American dream still lives. Uh, but, you know, you talk about how we go through in this country, and we certainly are seeing it now, these spasms of anti-immigrant fervor. And, um, and right now, it's mainly against Hispanics. And you have a wonderful Hispanic. Family. Well, we're seeing this against move the mic up? two Can groups you move in your America. Can up? Yeah, move it up. Is that a little better? I'll, okay. I'll hold it. Look, I'll hold it. Look, there are... There are two groups in America today 
they're subject to tremendous prejudice and persecution. Hispanics and Muslims, we all know that. I'm sorry to say, having looked at this issue for many century, over many centuries as a historian, this is a very American phenomenon. Jamie Morris, who was here just before me, talked about the Statue of Liberty, and we love to talk about the Statue of Liberty, we love to tell the stories about the nickels and dimes that built the pedestal, and we get teary-eyed about our own immigrant ancestors. The fact is, however, throughout our entire history as a country, we have also had spasms of anti-immigrant feeling. And what is happening today, unfortunately, is totally keeping with American tradition. In 1750s, 1750s, the group that everybody was attacking were the Germans. 1790s, it was the French. In the 1840s, the Know Nothing Party prospered as a political party in this country by attacking Irish Catholics. In the 1880s, we passed the Chinese Exclusion Act to stop Chinese from immigrating at all. In the 1910s, there were Italians were considered non-white in many parts of this country. And in the 1920s, we hanged Sacco and Vanzetti as much as anything for their nationality and their immigrant status as for their political views. In the 1940s, we interned 120,000 loyal Japanese American citizens. In my humble opinion, the haters were wrong then and they're wrong today. And they're not just wrong because of sentiment. And they're not just wrong because of some romantic notion of our wonderful ancestors. They're wrong on the facts. Because the fact is that immigrants give far more to this country than they take away. They contribute more. They contribute more economically. They contribute to our vitality. They contribute to our entrepreneurship. The day this book was published, last October, two Americans, Two Americans won the Nobel Prize for Physics, one born in Canada, one born in China. Both of them did their work in America. One did the uh, scientific work that created fiber optics. The other did the scientific work that created digital photography. Now you tell me how many Americans are working in jobs today because those two scientists were welcomed in America and didn't do their work somewhere else. So, but if you look at the history, if you look at the history, Going back to 1750, the language is exactly the same because what the assumption is that America is now perfect and that the next, we have to pull up the drawbridge to stop the next group, the Germans, the French, the Irish, the Jews, the Italians, the Japanese, the Chinese. The next group is going to corrupt our culture and degrade our character. Profoundly misunderstands the nature of America. Genius of America is we're never perfect. We're never perfect. We're striving for a more perfect union. That's and right if the, there. And if the haters had their way, most of us in this room would be back in Bialystok in Poland <laughs> or wherever your family is from, as mine is. And the story I tell that illustrates this is about a Hispanic man named Pablo Romero. Pablo was born in a small village in rural Mexico. He had to drop out of school when he was 10 years old. There was no school left in his village. And in any case, his parents needed the money. So he uh, went to work. And his father brought him to America as a farm worker when he was 13 years old. And he worked in the lettuce fields of, of Salinas, California for seven years. And then he was drafted into the American army. And it was the best thing ever happened to him. He went to Germany. And he um, earned his high school equivalency. And he... Um, uh, really impressed his commander who said, I'm going to come back looking for you in Salinas, Romero. And if I find you back in the lettuce fields, I'm going to kick your butt because you can do something more than that. He came back to America and through the help of some, um, of all things, uh, benevolent government bureaucrats, um, helped him enroll in a community college. He went to school at night every night while working in the lettuce fields. He went, did go back to the lettuce fields, went to community college. Then I kick him out of the library every night at, at midnight. After two years, he gets a scholarship to UC Irvine. He's studying at UC Irvine, still hasn't been to high school. And a, one of his Hispanic professors said to him, Romero, you should consider going to medical school. 
He said, medical school, I haven't been to high school. He said, Romero, how many Spanish-speaking doctors are there in Salinas, California? The answer, of course, was zero. He, got, he applies to medical school. Can't get to Case Western in Cleveland by himself. He had a trucking license. So he gets a trucking assignment to drive a semi-trailer to Cleveland. Got to be the only kid in the history of Case Western Medical School who drove to his interview driving a semi-trailer. <laughs> they took him. He decided not to go, but he did enroll at UCSF, University of California, San Francisco Medical School. In his senior year, he failed a test. He was horrified. He went to the, uh, went to the, um, uh, to the professor and said, I knew this stuff. And the guy said, you people, you people can't do the work, and your test proves it. He's aghast. He said, show me the test. The guy shows him the test. Two pages had stuck together. But because this professor saw Pablo through the lens of you people, he failed him. When Pablo pointed out the problem, the guy agreed to review the test, put a big A on it, threw the book at Pablo, and said, get the hell out of here. He was so embarrassed. Today, friends, Pablo Romero runs a neighborhood medical clinic in Salinas, California, where 90% of his clients are farm workers. He today takes care of the children and grandchildren of the people he worked in the fields next to all those years. I do not know, I do not know a better American than Pablo Romero. So we have time for a few questions. There are microphones on at the front of each aisle. Uh, if anybody has a question that they want to want to raise, um, Steve, one of the things that you found was the feminization of, yes. of immigration. This is a very interesting phenomenon. As I said to Koki, there are some things that are, are very different about modern immigration, and one of them is the feminization of immigration. A majority of immigrants today are women. Historically, this was not true. But two very interesting things have happened to make this more and more possible. First of all, it is far more um, possible from a cultural and social point of view to, for women to emigrate by themselves. Historically, women needed men. They needed a brother, a father, an uncle to watch over them. Today, that's not true. The second thing that's happened is economic opportunity. Historically, a lot of the jobs that were open to immigrants were jobs for muscle and for brawn. Today, with the switch to a service economy, women in many ways are more marketable than men. My mom, who just died a few weeks ago, in suburban hospital in, in, uh, in suburban Maryland here, many of you know it, every single person who took care of my mother in that hospital was a foreign-born woman of color. Every single one. And if you took those women from Jamaica and Trinidad and Rwanda and the Cameroons out of suburban hospital or any hospital in Washington today, it would collapse overnight. So thank you very much. Um, you guys are communicators for a living and you obviously have some pretty powerful uh, bully pulpits, if you will. So how do we move the Titanic away from the iceberg? How do we, we keep telling these stories of great immigrants that are doing great things here and yet we still have this hate which you know, we, we live, we have freedom of speech, so we have this kind of challenge going on. But there are boundaries. You don't get to yell fire in a crowded theater. So how do we collectively do this? Well, look, That's as I question. said to you, uh, I don't know how many of you heard the question, but she asked about the, the fact that today there still is this tremendous uh, a sense of animosity toward immigrants. Look, as I said to you, there's nothing new about this. We have to understand that there is, we've gone through this for several reasons. First of all, um, there is this impulse to xenophobia in our country. It's very deeply inbred. Uh, secondly, it, it's worse in times of economic stress because then people say, well, foreigners are taking our jobs. N it is not true. Foreigners are not taking our jobs. Foreigners are creating new jobs. But it's an easy thing to say. All I can do is say, to try to tell these stories, I'm not a writing, a, I haven't written a political book, I've written a book of stories, it's just stories. But I hope people will understand the contributions Americans are making every day to our well-being. And that's all I think we can do. But, but I think it's a useful thing to do. But the other thing that does happen, that you've certainly seen, 
is intermarriage, you know. And the people who were once the other are now your son-in-law. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and that, that tends to change things. You know? um, uh, very <laughs> much so. Um, the moment of greatest stress in many immigrant families is when their children get married, and particularly their girl children, because that's when they define who they are and who their parents' grandchildren are going to be. Uh, but as Koki said, in many ways, the, those moments bring us more together than separate us. Is there a question over here? Yeah, you, guys, uh, you guys started off talking about a little advice for marriage. And um, <laughs> Koki, you've had a distinguished career. And I'd like to ask you both, how has um, having your career where you have so many responsibilities, so many challenges, and you've really climbed up that ladder, how has that strengthened your marriage? And what's some advice you might have for some newlyweds facing those things? <laughs> Well, you can start by Go buying our it. book. <laughs> <laughs> it's for sale. We just signed the couple. Go ahead, Kurt. No, no, no. You go. Um, I'm dying to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody needs an editor. I just married mine uh, and brought her along. Uh, but uh, I really think that the, um, you know, Koki is Catholic. I'm Jewish. And so we have our specialty are interfaith marriages. And um, uh, I think, but look. I came to believe that all marriages are mixed marriages. Let's start with a marriage between a man and a woman. Anybody who's been married more, anybody who's been married more than two weeks knows that gender is far more a significant difference than ethnicity or religion. Um, and even, and even same-sex couples, the fact is the same issues arise. Issues of tolerance, issues of mutual respect, um, and, uh, and issues of, um, of, of taking pride in the judge's accomplishments. And one of the our greatest accomplishments we take pride in are our six grandchildren, and it's, it's a particular pleasure to have a nine-year-old grandchild sitting here and listening to us in the faint hope that someday she'll grow up and actually remember who we were. <laughs> uh, yeah. Could you comment briefly about the success of Vietnamese in the United States and also... Uh, the success of what Vietnamese. I did? Vietnamese. Vietnamese. And also just to comment that uh, the congressional seat formerly held by Koki's parents is now held by a Vietnamese Republican. That's true. Um, yeah. The Vietnamese are a great success story in this, in this country. Um, few, um, uh, few people are more hardworking and few people struggled more to get here. The, fam the Vietnamese family in my book tried to escape from Vietnam you know, a dozen times. And they finally escaped. They were floating free on the open sea. The, uh, the uh, engine had conked out in their boat. And um, uh, the mother, Tu Yen, in the family said to me, to save my two children, the next thing I was going to do was have to slit my wrist and feed my children my blood. Now it didn't come to that because they saw land the next day, but in that period in Southeast Asia, if you, if you washed up on the shore of Cambodia, you'd be killed. And if you washed up on the shore of Thailand, you'd be safe. And you can imagine the moment when uh, my student's father stood in the prow of that boat and called out, where are we? Literally, it was a life and death question. Fortunately, it was Thailand. And then eventually the family found sanctuary in the Philippines before they came to America. And that child, my student, was born in the refugee camp in the Philippines. And her name today is Thai Phi for the two countries, Thailand and the Philippines, that gave her sanctuary. Her family is not unusual. The struggle and the tenacity and the courage that her family showed to escape from Vietnam and survive that hardship is just one tiny chapter of this marvelous story that immigrants are writing every day. We're getting a sign saying overtime, so we're going to have to say thank you and goodbye, but um, it was very, very nice to be with you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.